Hi, I'm Greg Thompson. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Information Technology at Union Institute and University. Today we're going to talk about our data center and what we can do in a data center for a school of this size. And I like to say that we live within our means. So this isn't the typical data center you would see at a major university or also not one that you would see at a small high school. So this is going to fall somewhere in between. So we'll start with our connection into the data center. So we start with our fiber connection into the building and this fiber actually comes from the street underground into the building and it comes in these fiber connections from Time Warner Telecom. These connections are capable of going up to one gigabit in speed. However, we pay for them according to usage. So what we've done is we've contracted with Time Warner to where we pay for a 100 meg connection and then out of that 100 meg connection, because they only bill in increments of gigabit, 100 meg, and out of that 100 meg connection, we're then paying Ornet, which is the Ohio Supercomputing Network Consortium, we pay them for 25 megabits of actual bandwidth. So we have the potential to scale up to 1,000 gigabit, 1,000 megabits, but we're using just 25 at this point. So scalability is a very important feature when you're building out a network connection because everybody is using video and audio now, so that uses tremendous amounts of bandwidth. So we needed to be prepared for that growth in the future. So that's our connection to the outside world. So what happens is after that connection comes in on fiber, then it comes over here to our network switches over here, and it comes into our firewall. We have a Cisco firewall, which is a fairly standard choice for firewall in most locations. Uh, there's different levels. We have a 5510. Uh, obviously, larger locations will have a higher end firewall. But this is pretty good for our usage. And then from the firewall, we also ha we have traffic that goes into our spam filters and we use Barracuda for our spam filters. We have two of those so we have redundancy. One is here, one is in a separate room on a different floor. And then from there then we go into our network. So then we go into our network backbone which actually goes over here to these switches on this other side. So our network backbone starts right here with what we call our core switch. So this is where all the main devices plug in. So we have our connection to the internet coming over here, and from there we then connect to our servers, and we connect to the other floors in the building. So the core switch is here. We have a backup core switch, so we have our redundancy as well. Redundancy is extremely important when it comes to IT. Everything we do, we try to have redundancy. But even when we try to do that, there's certain areas that you cannot be redundant with. So we have to accept the fact that in our situation, we have a single firewall, which we, as we are aware is a single point of failure. We also have a few other little pieces that are individual points, but for the most part, we have redundancy in all, in all locations. Now, another interesting thing that we've done here at Union is we've gone to voice over IP for our telephones. So that's called VoIP for most people. VoIP phones use network connections to activate them. So the, this switch right here is what's called a PoE switch, which is power over Ethernet. A PoE switch sends power from these, net, these ports through the network connections to the phone at people's desks. So this actually powers the phone. The phones come on through this power. So if something were to happen to this switch and the power went out to this one switch, then all the phones for this entire that are connected to the switch would go off as well. So this is, in a sense, a form of single point of failure. However, for phones, that's not typically an issue, and switches are usually fairly reliable. And we also have additional redundant power built in that I'll talk about as well, which gives us a little bit of more reliability. So in this room, and we're in a basically a server room, server closet, server center, you know, there's a lot of different names for it. Uh, in this room, we have the outlets in the room are all plugged into, on the, other, on the outside of this building, a generator. And it is a natural gas power generator. So in the event of an electrical outage in this area, which does happen frequently actually, the, there, nothing in this room will lose power because this room is all connected to that, that generator. And that generator, like I said, runs off natural gas. So as long as natural gas can get to the generator, that will continue to run forever. When we had Hurricane Ike, 
which came through here a number of years ago. The power to this whole area was out for days. We ran on that generator power for, I think it was four days in a row. And we had no outage during that time because of that. Now, the generator takes a minute, or actually it takes about 10 seconds to kick in, to start working. So when power is lost, the generator doesn't, isn't running automatically, it comes on. So to get around that, on the other side of these UPSs, or on the other side of these switches, are a stack of small, inexpensive UPSs. These are backup power supplies. So we have a handful of these, which are actually plugged into the, outlet, into the wall outlets, which are connected to the generator. So what happens is, if the power were to go out, then what would happen is the room would essentially switch over to these little UPSs just long enough for the generator to kick on and then power this room perpetually. So as long as there's not a break in the gas line to the generator, we can run forever on that. So this is, this is the power backup for this area. Now over here, this is the main server rack for, our, for all of our systems. We've consolidated most things into this one rack. This is the back side of the rack. Tremendous heat comes out of the back of this. So this room has to have a lot of cooling at all times. So we have a separate air conditioner in the room just for that purpose. So this air conditioner is just for the purpose of cooling this room. And that, as well, that is also on the generator as well. So if we lose power, we still have our cooling as well. So worst case scenario, this is the best place to be in the event of a disaster. <laughs> Second floor. So all this heat that comes off the back does generate heat issues. So you can see we've had to make some modifications. We even had just recently because we added some servers, they added an additional, I know it doesn't look great, but you know when it comes to IT, it's more about getting the work done versus it looking beautiful. So they added some direct cooling right over top of the server rack over here. So we have air coming directly down to, on the back side of all these servers. So now if we go around to the front of the server rack, what we have here is a very standard server rack and each of these numbers is considered a unit on the rack. So this is considered one U, so number 36 is a U. So that's important to network people because server racks, as you see, can fill up very quickly so you run out of space and we value the space in these racks because we try to get them as dense as possible to save space. So a number of years ago when we were buying servers, like these are from about four years ago, you can see that these are two U's. They fill up two units in the rack. So these three servers were ones that we bought about four years ago. And then last year we bought some newer servers and you can see those are only one U. Each one of these is one U, so we bought two servers. And just to give you some comparison, four years ago, when we bought these servers, each of these came with 32 gigabytes of memory, and these were maxed out in memory. These servers we bought with 128 gigabytes of memory, and there's plenty of room for expansion still in these. So this is good because what we do is we run a virtual server farm on these servers. So this isn't a single server for our intents and purposes. This is a lot of servers. So on these five servers we have right here, we have about 50 virtual servers. What are these servers supporting? The, vir the servers are used for our student information system, which is a form of uh, ERP system and it's specific to schools. And it also holds our web servers, our network domain controllers, our antivirus servers. Basically everything the university uses, all of our databases are on here. So these hold everything that the university, all of our university information is right here, right in front of you. And all the information itself is actually stored down here, which is why we call the brain of the system. This is the SAN, which is a storage area network. This is the main unit, which does all the processing, and it has some disks built into it. And then these two shelves are just additional hard drives, additional disks for more space. So this is where the actual data is stored. So we have multiple disks that right here that's, that hold all the information. These five servers talk to these disks right here. So they share these disks for, with the information. So this is kind of what comprises our, uh, our setup now. So we have 
We're using VMware for our virtual servers, and we have these as five VMware servers, and then these five VMware servers then talk to our storage area network right here, and then this all talks through another switch which is in the back of the server rack, which is a dedicated switch for the SAN. And we actually call it a SAN switch for that reason. So this switch right here, even though you see all these network connections running to it, these network connections are just are an internal communication between, between the SAN and the servers. And this never goes out on our actual network. So all the data that goes between the servers is all going through these network connections right here on this dedicated SAN switch. This is, as I mentioned earlier, one of our single points of failure that concerns me. So we're trying. what we're going to do is probably try to split this into two separate switches so that we once again remove that, that single point of failure, we have some more redundancy. So this, and then even the servers themselves, if you can see back here, we have multiple network connections to each server. So we have four on this one. We also have redundant power supplies. In addition to the redundant power supplies, these plug into two separate places in the room. They don't even plug into the same place. So if the outlet or the UPS that one of these is plugged into dies, the other power supply will still continue to function. So we have lots of redundancy built into things. So that's the server section. The other major upgrade that we've made in the last few years is that we've replaced our phone system. And we've switched from what was, a, what was considered to be basically an old fashioned, it was called a digital phone system, but it's what most people would kind of consider similar to like an analog phone system. Uh, so we switched from an, a digital phone system to a voice over IP phone system. So we now have these VoIP phones now, which as I mentioned earlier, are powered through the network. So these phones are all basically a small computer. And believe it or not, a phone like this costs almost $300. So it is like a small computer, so people have to uh, treat them accordingly. And these are the this is the phone system itself right here, these, these devices, and also the voicemail for the system. So that's all stored here. So, and then you see that sometimes you get an alarm for insufficient bandwidth. That's actually not an unusual alarm for a phone system to get. So that's not something to be concerned about. And it even tells you the extension that had the alarm. So you can check that out if you're concerned about it. So this is our uh, voice over IP phone system now, which is, uh, is, which is connected to all the university locations. And all locations that we have all talk to this one central location. And in many ways, it's kind of like a hub and spoke network where Cincinnati is the center of, of that hub. And then each of the spokes are our different remote centers. So even though they all have their own servers, they all have their own phones and things like that, and phone systems, this is still the central point for all communication between the centers. The last thing that we have that we've just added in the last year or so is a security system. Uh, we've added a, a, a basically a couple of DVR systems, one's for inside the building, one's for outside the building for security purposes. Uh, these record all the time. We have two to three weeks of recordings for each on each of these systems. And these are directly hardwired into the different, uh, the different cameras outside the building. And if you look behind here, you can even see where all the wiring runs in. And this is all the wiring that goes out to the rest of the building. So these are all directly wired into these systems, into these camera systems here. So we have 16 here and 16 here. So the DVRs record everything, so if we ever have, have any incidents, for example, we had graffiti across the street and, we, and it was at 10 o'clock at night, all we had to do the next day was pull up the camera for that, that area, rewound to that time period, played it, and we could see the person spray painting the graffiti on there. So we can export that video, hand it over to the police. So these are our, our DVRs for security. And those are the biggest changes that we've had in, in lately. So we have our new voice over IP system, our security system, our storage area network, and our power over ethernet switches. So those are the, the that's basically an overview of our data center.
This is our, our monitoring system here in the IT offices. And in the IT office, what we do like to do is at a glance to be able to see if we have any systems that are having any problems. And we also like to monitor our network bandwidth and our internet bandwidth. So we have two different screens here. The first one is a system we use called Server Nanny. There are lots of different systems for this. Uh, What's Up Gold is a very, very popular one. And this one is good because it has a, it has a little link right here which if you click current faults, you can see which systems are currently not available. And we knew that these were down because we were, we were aware of this earlier today. We shut down a, a server, and you can see that we have that obvious red light here, which gives us a very clear indication that we need to check something. So we have somebody who sits here at all times uh, during the day, and then we have people who walk by constantly who will check it as well. So what we do is if we see a red light, we just take a glance, we just make sure it's what we expect to see, which in this case we try not to have any red lights just so we're never lulled in that false sense of confidence that something is supposed to be down. But in this case we uh, purposely turned off this server today and then this is showing even a computer in the classroom downstairs that we monitor and we monitor all classroom computers as well so the reason that's important is because if we have someone coming in to give a presentation we want to make sure that the computers are turned on and ready to go for them so anytime a computer in a classroom is turned off we get that notification as well so we have that summary here and then over here is at a glance uh, our Cisco monitoring software which shows our internet uh, traffic. This is the window that we watch the most. Uh, this shows the incoming, uh, incoming and outgoing bandwidth that's being used. So we have a 25 meg connection which uh, would indicate the peak up here. So for just a brief second we were up there at 25 on outgoing data which means that somebody was probably emailing a large attachment or a series of attachments. And then, in, and then the incoming is the blue. So it's five o'clock, so we've reached the end of the work day, which, so it's not very surprising that our bandwidth is down here at the bottom. During the day, though, we see this go all the way up to 25 regularly. We'll also see it average around 10 to 12 megabits per second. So this is the key indicator for us. We keep an eye on this, this uh, bandwidth right here. So this gives us, at a glance, a way to just you know, keep an eye on our systems.